Welcome to the first in the Mood Indigo podcast series, brought to you by the Indigo Press. In the first episode, editor and critic Ella Wakatama Alfri talks to Zimbabwean born novelist and journalist Panache Chikamatsi about her home country, the born free generation, and her new essay, These Bones Will Rise Again, available now from all good booksellers. This is followed by a short reading of the book from the author. Panache, welcome. This is our very first podcast for the Indigo Press, so it's amazing to have you here. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. So today we're celebrating publication date Yay. for... <laughs> for these bones will rise again, which coincidentally is the not even co- fortuitously mm-hmm. is the first book published by the Indigo Press. Mm-hmm. So I'm very proud. Mm-hmm. So I want to start off by asking you. Um, we're going to sort of this interview is going to be mostly about you because okay. we're inviting people to get a copy of the book and to read mm-hmm. it. And radio interviews coming up today will talk a lot about the book. But I thought since this was our own podcast, mm-hmm. we could use it as a chance to get to know you better. Yeah. So just to start off with, you were born in Harare mm-hmm. in Zimbabwe, mm-hmm. and at tis- Zimbabwe and uh, maternity ward. Okay, mm-hmm. and tell us why that is significant. Well, I think it's significant, or it was significant to me for, I don't know, I just always remember seeing my mother's, uh, I think the maternity cards they used to give people, um, and, I, and if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, there was a picture of this old woman, this Nehanda, on this card, and you'd sort of see sort of my development over time, you know, KGs, mm-hmm. blah, 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 those kinds of things, and um, I guess there was something very that connected me to, to Zimbabwe in that way. So it was a very different way of, of, of understanding where I come from. And then sort of, I'm just thinking about that mark that we all have, or of a particular generation, I think the... The vaccination mark. The vaccination mark, mark. Yes. yeah. Something that connected me to Zimbabwe in that way. Um, and I remember just this, as I'm thinking about that, you know, when you'd go to school projects and you'd need to know, you know, how many cages were you when you were born? Mm-hmm. You know, those kind of things. My mother could, you know, literally take this out and she had, you know, my development over time. So that was always interesting before I knew who this Mwia Nehanda So your was. baby book is that's yeah. recording all your progress yeah. has, has the name of yeah. this 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 person, this yeah. Ambuya on it. And when do you think your first realization that this had been a real person. When did that realization come, or was she always sort of there in the back of your mind? I think it was there in the back of my mind. I, I couldn't pinpoint. This is the moment mm-hmm, where I realized, mm-hmm. you know, what this really means. I I remember also in those, you know, conversations where I, I think my parents always t- will say that I used to question them about a lot of things, um, and I remember something somewhere I'd heard that Zimbabwe used to have another name. And it was Rhodesia. And so, you know, that's just, you know, if you can imagine, that's my childhood understanding of it used to have another name. And, you know, sometimes your parents just want to, listen, I'm doing whatever it is that I'm doing right now. So can you please move on? And sometimes the answers that they give me are very funny. But I remember saying to her, Mama, I, you know, Zimbabwe used to have another name. Why? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and she just said, well, it was Rhodesia. And, you know, we continued and that sort of thing. So there were a lot of these sort of moments as well that I had. Um, but, yeah, I think Nehanda is someone who's always at the back of my mind. And over time, as I began to read Zimbabwean mm-hmm. history, and that was something that because I was far removed from the country and everything that was happening at the same time, um, particularly within the 2000s, and there's this onslaught against um, Zimbabwean identity, um, I started reading a lot of these books about, and at that time I wanted to be a politician, so I thought, you know, you can never know where you're going unless you know where you've come from, which is such a cliche. Um, it's true, though. You know, it's the first time I heard that, let me tell you, it's a very embarrassing thing. It was um, <laughs> Will Smith, The Wild West. Um, oh, bad movie. <laughs> I love that 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 um, that DVD. But anyway, he said you never know where you're going, be going until you know, you know where you've been from. You know, so that's when I started mm-hmm. thinking about that. So that was my entry point into reading um, Zimbabwe and reading political biographies and that kind of thing. So that was really. I want to backtrack a little yeah. bit. One because I'm I'm sitting here beaming because I can so easily mm-hmm. imagine you as an 
relentlessly inquisitive yeah, child. Yeah. I, I think that that's, it's very easy to imagine that. You you talked about this connection through your baby book with yeah. Mbiyane Handa, and then you mentioned something about being far removed yeah. and also about sort of needing some kind of connection mm-hmm. and identity. Tell us about that, because you didn't grow up in Zimbabwe. No, um, we moved when I was three years old. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that way, again, um, so born free of Zimbabwe, so born after 1980s, Zimbabwe's independence. And we moved to South Africa in 1994, which is the year of um, South Africa's, um, the end of apartheid, if you want mm-hmm. to call it that. Um, and so it was interesting because I grew up in a very Zimbabwean community. Um, so there Where did you live? Of, in Durban. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, we moved to Durban. Uh, my father had, um, started pra- well, he started working at the, the hospital there. Your father's um, a doctor? My father's a doctor. So mm-hmm. there was a whole community of Zimbabwean doctors that were living um, in, in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the brides, you know, that we went to, so here, I don't know if you, what you call that, you call it barbecue, um, whatever it is you call it, we'd listen to um, a lot of Zimbabwean music, so it was very much there, mm-hmm. but that's not the same thing as living in the country. Mm-hmm. And my parents were very patriotic, um, not necessarily in, a, any, in terms of any alignment to any party, but they were very proud to be Zimbabwean. Mm-hmm. Um, so that also meant that we were constantly visiting Zimbabwe a couple times a year. So mm-hmm. um, a large part of my childhood is being on the road. Um, mm. and listening to music on the road and listening to my parents and particularly um, they always used to love telling us stories about them growing up so I really grew up in their nostalgia for the Zimbabwe that they grew up mm-hmm. in and particularly because um, the landscape itself lends itself or for a long time it lends itself to that nostalgia because the buildings were probably the very same buildings that they mm-hmm. went to school in um, save for a lick of paint or sometimes it wasn't that lick of paint mm-hmm. um, perhaps mm-hmm. the building had just actually deteriorated you know for a long time you'd have the, the glass bottle Coca-Cola um, you know so it was very easy to imagine a time before so literally when you'd pass the the, the the the, uh, the border or you go past the Limbobo River you'd really feel you're in a different yes. temporality than you were in South Africa so even the signage was very old until recently they changed it I'm like no we like the old signage this is yeah. so interesting to me though yeah. because I think that in describing your, your parents Zimbabwe yeah. you're probably describing my Zimbabwe yeah. I think I'm quite yeah. close in age with them and for me a lot of the, the remembering mm-hmm. that you were doing in the book was either I would recognize from stories from yeah. my own father yeah. or my own life, mm-hmm. and certainly with the music. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's songs that you talk about in the book that came out when yeah. I was a teenager, yeah. <laughs> and um, not even a yeah. teenager, not, you know, young yeah. adolescent. And this this idea of sort of um, of memory and mm-hmm. the things and the stories that families tell yeah, yeah. is something that's quite central to these bones will rise again. Yeah. And I wondered if you could talk a, a little bit on a personal level about this being near home but not being quite there. You mm-hmm. told us about the visiting and so on. What does that do to you if you have patriotic parents and you're living in quite a Zimbabwean community? You still are in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So you're going to school with South Africans mm-hmm. and your friends are South African, I guess, and Zimbabwean. At a time in South Africa's history that's that's quite pivotal. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to us about that a little bit. I mean, my relationship to both Zimbabwe and South Africa has changed um, over time. Um, I think as a reaction to the kind of um, alienation or rather the, the ridiculing that Zimbabwean identity went through, particularly mm-hmm. in the 2000s, mm-hmm. um, it was not something you were supposed to be proud of. Can you give the listeners a little bit of background? So by then, uh, this is the 2000s, this is land reform is happening. Um, so all of a sudden, all over you know TV, um, it's you know Mugabe Zimbabwe, and you know in, even in the literature that I was beginning to read, mm-hmm. it was a lot of particularly white Zimbabwean um, literature around sort of you know I had a farm in Africa type of, mm-hmm. of novel, um, and even white, by the time I was in, in in high school, we had a lot of kids, well particularly white Zimbabwean kids mm-hmm. who were there. So, you know, it, we were always the butt of the joke, of, uh, of jokes in class, right? And it was about, you know, money, our uh, worthless currency, the fact that you don't have um, goods in stores. So we had an influx. By then, I was living in Bulugwani, which is about 250 kilometers from the border, mm-hmm. from uh, Bight Bridge border. Um, and so you had this huge influx of Zimbabweans. So. so these are Zimbabweans who are fleeing economic hardship and in some cases fleeing political... 
Not so much. Was it all it a, was mostly economic. Mm-hmm. So really, you've got um, one. The, there's different classes of people. So there are yes. those who are the so-called border jumpers. So people who are jumping without papers. There are, you know, a lot of my family members were coming, but not necessarily moving. They were coming to buy goods in Uruguay. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that was, you know, all of a sudden in the city, you're always seeing Zimbabwean number plates outside. You know, the big mm. um, stores. You know, so that was something where people became very suddenly aware of. Of Zimbabweans, and but you were others who weren't wanted. Yeah, exactly. You were others who weren't wanted, um, and so th- at the same time, my parents were very much insistent on their Zimbabweanness, mm-hmm. um, and so you know this is a time where people are you know denouncing the citizenship and that sort of thing. For mm-hmm. a very long time, they were very. Um, insistent on remaining at least Zimbabwean in terms of their actual citizenship mm-hmm. um, and it took a very long time before eventually we took on the, the South African passport so that's a whole other story um, but that was important because at the same time it's not just going to Zimbabwe it's specifically going Kumusha so going to what your, does Kumusha mean tell so listeners. Kumusha is it means many different things but mm-hmm. quite literally it could be Quite literally, it's home, mm-hmm. uh, but it's it's particularly a home that's ancestral. So mm-hmm. it it would be the place where your family has been buried. That's mm-hmm. I think that's the best way I can, mm-hmm. I can think of that. Mm-hmm. So you've got that lineage. So for me, going Kwamurewa, which is you know um, where I can see where my father grew up, I can see where his grandfather uh, had his home. So everything that he's telling me, all those stories he's telling me about, is very real now when you see exactly what it is that they're talking about so they were very um insistent on going kumusha and also my mother's um a village which is nyazura or actually kwa gandia if we're if we're being uh, more specific um and so you know when you're going there they're taking us to their old school so we've mm-hmm. been to saint augustine's we've been to Hartzell, we've been to all of those places mm-hmm. so these things were very very real um, and so that really gave me a sense of identity. Um, and th- my parents always, I think also part of it was a disciplining tactic. Um, so, you know, when... <laughs> <laughs> Did you need it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you want to go to sleepovers, you want to do things, and your mm-hmm. parents are kind of... The, the one way to assert difference is to say, well, do you know what, at the end of the day, you might be here, but we are from Murewa. It's not even from Zimbabwe, it's not from Harare. That's so We're from Murewa, right? So whatever happens at the end of the day... This this way we're going to go back it's to Zivakwa exactly yes right. know where so you came from know exactly where you came yeah. from so that was really important and you're also having fights silly fights with your friends and whatnot and you're like oh it doesn't matter because I have a home uh, you know so that was my my yeah. children get that from me it's like uh, I but theirs is always remember, remember whose child you are yeah yeah and I think that's really important this this idea of of sort of a connection with the past Mm -hmm. but not just a connection because you're from there but because there's a lineage Mm -hmm. of people who have made you who you are it's very central to your book but I want to talk about something you said earlier when you were talking about the trips Mm -hmm. you said you were were on the road a lot yeah so when we commissioned you to write this book the starting point was the events of November 2017 what you ended up doing was very much memoir, but it's also a road trip, mm-hmm. and I love that. It's a, yeah. it's a road trip essay, yeah. essentially. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that without going too much about, into the contents of the book. Sure. Um, I really love road trips, and I, for a long time, I actually haven't driven from Bulugwani to, to Harare, and I mm. always feel that when I take the flight, it's almost taking a shortcut uh-huh. because I don't really get into, I don't get the, 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 the SIG, if I want to mm-hmm. think of it that way, into Zimbabwe and getting to see and experience the, the, the landscape. Um, so because, again, that was a one way that my, my parents were very busy, particularly my mm-hmm. dad was very busy. So one place that we always connected was on the road. Mm-hmm. That's, he always made time for um, uh, traveling and particularly always saying that any place is a destination. Right, so mm-hmm. we traveled a lot of, all over Southern Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, and so here, yeah, this was interesting because I hadn't really planned to do it this way. I think I, we were going to really write most of the book while I'm in Johannesburg. Um, and I hadn't been to Zimbabwe in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this time I was like, okay, I have to go and I need to go and experience some of the stuff for myself. Um, and it really just happened that way mm. because I think a lot of times it just thought, okay, I'll, I'll rent a car and I'll drive myself there. And my family was like, hell no, you're not driving by yourself. Um, and so people just really availed themselves to me. Um, my family specifically availed themselves to me in ways I just really didn't expect. There's a wonderful sense of those family connections yeah. in the book. And I think for me, that was the, 
that was a gift that you gave to us because yes. we thought we were going to get something that was essentially political analysis. Yes. And what is rather wonderful is that you then get this very strong sense of a country through a family. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, w one of the things I really enjoyed about being in Zimbabwe is, and, and because I didn't know I needed this, because when I live in South Africa, I guess I have my friends, I have you know my connections that I've made over the years, but there's something about having family that I can call on. You know, mm -hmm. say, hey, Seguru, I need to do one, two, three. Okay, Seguru, Andy, let's go do one, mm -hmm. two, three. You know, we had a lot of that, which I don't usually get in South Africa. Yes. Um, and so that was a really great experience. A lot of times people would say, hey, you want to go to this place? Okay, what days work for you? Let's do one, two, three. And so it also made the trips... Um, it, it also made it a lot easier in some ways as well. Um, and also it means you're injecting that person's particular personality yes, yes. Into, into that as well. So the road trip aspect was a very big part of it. We traveled all over at least eastern Zimbabwe and also north, northwest Zimbabwe. Did you, did you feel that you, you learned something new about, about the country through, through this sort of period of exploration? Because uh -huh. you were asking a lot of questions. Yeah, I mean, I think because usually when we go to visit with my my family, that is my mother, my father, my brother, we're always in a rush. Mm -hmm. We're going up and down to see all kinds of family members because our family is huge. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we have a huge extended family. Um, and so it was really great to just be still in Zimbabwe, yes. for example, yes. and also to get to experience people who are not my family as well. Mm -hmm. So like I always you know, told you, I went to a karate class in, mm -hmm. in downtown Harare, which was great. And I would walk in the streets and that kind of thing, which is something I don't usually get, mm -hmm. to, get to do. So, so you weren't a visitor? I wasn't a visitor. I mean, I still, I, in, in some ways, I hate to admit it, but it, it, there is still something different about knowing that you're going to leave after a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to stay as long as possible. But um, it was great, yeah, to just be in Zimbabwe as mm -hmm. opposed to be rushing up and down. Um, Panasha, this, this book is, we're guessing, probably the first book that's sort of attempting to mm -hmm. make sense in a very unique way mm -hmm. about the, the coup that was not a coup that mm -hmm. happened. It'll, I think, surprise readers mm -hmm. in that it takes them on a journey into the far past. Yeah. You also are quite bold in your... Um, you don't make a prediction for the future, mm -hmm. but you do, you do assert what needs to happen in order for the future to be one that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about your status as a born free, which you talked about at the very beginning, and your hopes for the future? Mm -hmm. So just to give context again, so the, con the concept of a born free is something very, I think, um, particular to Southern Africa mm -hmm. and Southern Africa's settler colonies, um, Zimbabwe and South Africa being the two dominant ones. Mm -hmm. So after independence, there's this idea that these uh, children who are born after the end of colonialism are now free of the past. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing happens again in, in South Africa. And we have mm -hmm. a whole range of terms around that, you know, and it's a rainbow nation and there's this kind of euphoria, you know, just as we're saying, you know, let bygones be got bygones and women to be the embodiment of this hope of mm -hmm. um, a new country. And I think in both countries, we start seeing how the past continues to stay with us and it's not going mm -hmm. to be something that we're simply going to wish away. That, mm -hmm. you know, if we just put these kids together in school, if we just, you know, allow people to live in the same suburbs, everything will be okay. And I'm part of that experiment. Um, in South Africa, um, you know, I went to what we call the former Model C schools, the multiracial schools, and for a long time, yes, we were great friends, but, you know, some of the tensions began to... Um, become apparent as we get older. Mm -hmm. um, as you see that people's opportunities are different, you start seeing, you know, hey, so-and-so is inheriting a farm. What does that mean? Why, why am I not inheriting certain things? And what does that mean for the kind of opportunities I think about in future? Um, and so you'll see, for example, there's a generation of people who are demanding that um, reassessment of the past. So, for example, roads must fall in South Africa, saying mm -hmm. we need to talk about the past because there's an insistence by an older generation that the past is the past. Um, and so I think in Zimbabwe, for example, we saw that um, the past coming to catch up yes. with us, particularly in the mid to late 90s, where people are demanding land reform, um, people are demanding the land that was promised to them. And we keep saying that when we don't resolve some of these issues, they're kind of 
get ahead of us and we're sort of then just reacting to and trying to manage in South Africa right now people are talking about land as well mm -hmm. so for me right now I, I think really when it comes to these bonds will rise again in a space where we began to think of Zimbabwe's future beginning where Mugabe ends so the idea that when the old go the new will come in mm -hmm. and everything will be okay and I think the reason why I, in, I invoke the the idea of spirit possession is the idea of those in the present speaking to those in the past mm -hmm. about the future to come. So the idea that this is really going to be an intergenerational effort is not going to be um, the effort of one generation. I think that's really important. Those in the present speaking to those in the past about the future to come. Yeah. That's a really good place for us to end the podcast and to encourage people to find out exactly what you mean about that. Panache, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Despite my deep-seated apprehension about the Citizens' Alliance with the military, on Saturday the 18th of November, the day of the Solidarity March in Harare, I drive with my cousin to a rally outside the Zimbabwean consulate in Johannesburg, the city with the largest concentration of my country's diaspora. Singing, waving flags, holding banners, taking selfies and wearing national colours are hundreds of people, some here legally, some not, some eager to go home, some only hoping for relief for family back home. I see many friends and acquaintances from over the years, bubbling with a kind of nervous excitement only partially masked under the apathy many of us have come to wear as our default attitude. Ah, Panache, you're here too? Come and see my daughter, she's also here. Did you see Fadzi? She's behind that banner with her aunt. Come and take a picture with me. I'm going to send it to my brother. They're on their way to State House. Ah, this time, Panache. This time, I'm telling you, the old man is gone. Tired of being told to go back home, of being called Liguere Guere, of using fake names on fake papers, of cleaning people's homes instead of teaching, of being accused of stealing people's jobs, of stealing their women, of wiring money through Western Union, of queuing with a Menendra bus driver to send groceries or medicines to family back home, of being unable to attend the funerals of their loved ones, of being unable to see their children grow up, they shout, Sokwanele, Jakwana, it is enough. Railing as if a final heave of energy is all that is needed to push the old man out and all their dreams and aspirations, big and small, for their country in. For their children to find decent jobs, for their parents to be able to have pensions to retire to, for hospitals they can send their relatives to without feeling they are sending them there to die, for national roads that do not risk their lives, for their speech to be free, for the lives of their family lost in Gukurahundi to be accounted for, for leaders who have won their respect and whom they have chosen, for a place they can make a home of again. For the rest of the 14-day revolution, I am glued to my phone and laptop. I have a TV, but I have not had any network subscriptions for years. Even now, I don't think to renew them. Because international media, with its many mostly foreign white male Africa experts, is tiring. What is most gritting are the remarks that the huge mass of citizenry working together with the army demonstrate what a peaceful coup should look like, and better yet, how educated and civilized Zimbabweans really are. The boldest of them stop just short of openly attributing this to 90 years of British colonialism. The exception is our trusted Zimbabwean reporter, Haru Mutasa of Al Jazeera English, but she makes frequent Twitter updates, so I don't have to tune in to the TV. I spend a lot of time scrolling through my Twitter timeline. In between, I call relatives and friends in Zimbabwe, but really, Twitter knows everything before everyone else. WhatsApp is our undisputed public sphere, connecting those at home with those in the diaspora. We share videos, screenshots of press statements, texts of news articles, broadcast links faster than anything on official media. With even more speed, we share memes, such as the Mugabe's as destitute hitchhikers out of state house, and voice notes, such as those with people expertly switching between Mugabe's deep cheese Zuru draw and the Queen's English. 
These keep us going with the humorous spirit Zimbabweans in and out of the country have long relied on to make it through the hard times for all these years. Thanks for listening to the Mood Indigo podcast series, brought to you by the Indigo Press. Visit theindigopress.com forward slash podcast to subscribe. Don't miss the next episode of the Mood Indigo podcast in September 2018.